The National Trust has decided to declare its hatred, or at least attempt to gaslight English people out of their own history um, of white people, which is a very odd strategy considering, and I don't wish to stereotype here, but I, I don't think most of the people attending the National Trust's parks and stately homes and the like are of the diverse diaspora that have arrived in the last couple of years. Could could be wrong, but so this sort of started because they've started a new initiative to get diverse communities out walking in their parks. This is very much the flavour of the decolonize the countryside movement, which whenever they say diversify or decolonize, it inevitably just means fewer white people because they have a pathological hatred of you know, folks like me with a paler complexion, I suppose. So the, the bit of the details on the project, it's called Walk Together Pathway, and it brings together eight walking groups to help boost representation among non-white ethnic groups. People from those ethnic groups accounted for only 1% of national park visitors in 2019, according to the National Trust, which is funding the scheme. And I know the National Trust is a registered charity. Do you know how much money they actually get from the government? I'm assuming they get a fair amount of subsidies every year. I mean, there's gift aid, I know that, for everything that's, that's brought in, but I've got no idea how much they, they, they get to make. But yeah, I mean, they need to be reminded this is the National Trust, not the Global Trust, right? Yeah. And yet they're, they're pushing ahead also with this terminology of global majority rather than, rather than uh, ethnic minority. And it's clearly an attempt made to belittle the achievements of white people of the West, of Britain more broadly, to undermine, to make them seem like an irre irrelevance and being inconsequential. And actually, it's this, this, this huge term, global majority, I think is inherently racist, obviously, because it's lumping together, you know, the Japanese, the Mexicans, and the, the Afghanis, <laughs> not people who have that much in common, and yet they're seen as this sort of, you know, one behemoth uh, entity. And uh, quite frankly, you know, it's, there's always an, an idea that the Western ideal of going out into the countryside is a universal ideal. And just because Westerners do it doesn't mean that it's a universality. In fact, you know, I mean, you know, 95% of black people don't swim. We've learned that last year, came out in a report. Is that because of systemic racism? In the, in, obviously not. These are cultural issues. There are reasons why certain cultures don't engage with the countryside. And yet, for some reason, people on the progressive left don't understand that. And it's essentially pushing forward a, a white ideal for other cultures. We had this when you remember a few, a few months ago, Google got into trouble uh, for if you typed in white people in Google images, you'd get ethnic minorities coming up all the time. And they were raked over the coals for that. And, they were, and so they said, oh, well, we will adjust this so that white people will show up. But when it comes to universal things, we will still represent the global majority, mm. such as dog walking. And I said, well, <laughs> only white people walk dogs, right? <laughs> this is yet another way that they don't understand that there's a uniqueness to the Western mind and Western psychology. And, you know, in, in Africa and Asia, people don't have dogs in the house. They don't take them for walks and so forth. And yet this is the mindset we're fighting against. There's a funny thing in um, the film, The Man Who Would Be King, set in the Victorian period, where um, people from the uh, Central Asia think it's crazy that Englishmen name dogs. It's mad to name a dog and treat it as like a beloved uh, member of the family and take it for walks and stuff. Yeah, it's a classic thing going out for a walk in the countryside. The Victorians love to do it. There's a great bit in um, Kenneth Clark's, Lord Kenneth Clark's Civilization, talk about how Victorians would often think nothing of walking 10 miles to post a letter. Well, there was a lively- Taking like the promenade. It's very, very English. There was a lively debate after the invention of the steam engine with John Ruskin and other uh, members of the Victorian intelligentsia that were petitioning against putting trains to go to the Lake District um, so that, because the argument was, okay, it allows more people to access it and therefore go and get in contact with nature and escape the smog-filled cities, but also, are we going to pollute the purity and, and beauty of the countryside by bussing people out like tourists? And so this was a serious concern about British heritage and conservation, and those kinds of conversations just weren't had in other areas of the world at the time. The other thing to say is I've been a member of the National Trust a couple of times in my life. It's not cheap. They get a lot of money from their membership. Um, and English Heritage. I've been a member of both at various times. And um, they don't just do parks and walks. They do, they do all sorts of things like their stately homes, ruins of old abbeys, all sorts of things, both English Heritage and National Trust. And uh, yeah, it's, white, it's old white people, <laughs> largely. I mean, many a time I've been to a, a sort of a country home or some ruins, and I was by far the youngest person there. Um, so again, it's just another captured thing, isn't it? It's, well, captured, it's been captured by ideologues, anti-white, anti-Western ideologues. And, uh, you know, it's right, it, it cuts right to the heart of things. You know, there's some things it doesn't really matter if it's captured and subverted. Or it, doesn't, it doesn't matter too much. 
But, you know, like if when people are trying to um, desecrate the cenotaph, it matters. If National Heritage and English Trust have been subverted, it matters. That matters, I'm afraid. Um, so, yeah, this isn't just like another one of our segments about, oh, look at this bad thing. It's re it really matters to me anyway. It's the equivalent oh. of trying to retroactively engrave ebonics onto the Rosetta Stone. Like, <laughs> it's, it's just an act of cultural vandalism. Yeah, I mean, the National Trust are quite literally custodians mm -hmm. of our heritage, at least in England. There's another one up in Scotland, obviously. And, you know, we, you know I keep telling, trying to explain to people that we are living now in a post-revolutionary society. The revolution's already happened. You don't have to have red flags flying from rooftops. There are cuckoos in the nests of all of our institutions. And the National Trust, you know, once they start, once the ideological apparatchiks inside there start using terms like global majority, this is newspeak being in, imposed upon us. And they're using it as a cudgel to bash us to say, well, you are in the minority. But actually, I think the fight back should be, well, why hasn't this global majority dominated the world for the last 500 years? You know, mm -hmm. actually, it, we should be talking about Western exceptionalism. And mm -hmm. how come the West are so unique that the West, 90% of the world's inventions are from the West? So why hasn't this global majority been able to do any of that? You know, why was it, you know, for example, it was only in 2010 that a man walked the entire length of the Nile. Where was he from? England. It was, in, it was in 2015 that the first person ever walked the length of the Amazon. Where was he from? England. It was 2019 that the first person walked the length of the Yangtze in China, a 5,000 or however many thousand year old civilization. Where was he from? Wales, right? So there is something unique about, about the, the West, particularly the Anglosphere, I would say. And we, and we don't have time enough to discuss it all here. But even the psychology of the Western, uh, Western person is unique. Even our, uh, the spatial awareness Facial recognition uh, it was, is worse amongst Westerners than it is amongst non-Westerners. There are so many different areas in which you can actually discern a very different psychology. And there are reasons for that, in particularly because the church banned uh, cousin marriages within degrees of consanguinity and resulted in the nuclear family that doesn't exist anywhere else. Because of that nuclear family, Westerners had to trust other people. That's why you get the emergence of guilds, of, uh, of chartered towns, university towns being established. And that social trust on, in other people led to the individualism and the dynamism and the social trust that creates strong economies and innovation. And that was one of the reasons that the West is totally unique because the West sees the world differently to the global majority. And that's something which we should be celebrating here in the West rather than constantly wearing a horsehair shirt and self-flagellating about our perceived wrongs. That's completely correct. I mean, the funny thing is, so so for those who, who aren't aware, the global majority framing has been adopted by the National Trust. And Kemi Badenox made some noise about this. And I'll, I'll read a bit from her response shortly. But the, the global majority heritage framing, was something that we balked at a couple of years ago. I, I spoke about this last week with, with Carl and Ralph Schollhammer. Um, in terms of the global majority is a framing that doesn't make much sense applied outside the Anglosphere context. It's kind of like when the Smithsonian during 2020 made that chart of quote unquote white capital W white behaviors, but it was like the King's English and being on time and queuing. These were, these were English behaviors. These aren't necessarily native to the Dutch or the French or the Italians, you know. So by saying global majority, unless you're speaking about English standards versus the rest of the world who do not have necessarily respect for the countryside or that kind of small town propriety where actually you no know, people do care about your business. And this is why the English won't play TikToks aloud or go on their phone on public transport, but increasingly as immigration has increased, we all notice this trend and in, in, in people standing on the wrong side of the escalator and things like that. That's the only way it makes sense of where the global majority do not necessarily behave like the English and we are a minority. But the interesting thing that's revealed there is, okay, if they really cared about minority rights, if they were if they were so concerned about ethnic minority rights in England, and it was on the principle of we want to protect minorities, then if the English are the true minority globally, why are you not for English conservation? Why are you at engaging in active vandalism of our history? And it's because it's not that you were ever concerned about minority rights. It wasn't that when Hamza Yusuf got up and decried the whiteness mm. of Scotland, he was making a nuanced point about racial equality. It's just that this was a Trojan horse of the fact that you hate white people. Exactly. Yeah. Um, absolutely. It just comes from, I think, of maybe just like the Robin D'Angelo type. It's just an attack on, and they say openly, on whiteness itself. Sort of the concept of almost in the abstract, uh, almost, but, you know, not exactly. You made loads of good points about the first things that Anglos did or Western Europeans, should we say. You know, first people around the world, well, it was a Portuguese, wasn't it? But, uh, but then Drake, you know, going around the world, uh, first guy at the top of Everest. Why wasn't that a Chinaman or a, a, someone from India? 
you know, it's a Kiwi or an Anglo anyway. Uh, Lord Miles reviving the curiosity of the English explorer to dangerous degrees even, but that, that you don't see that in many other civilizations. I mean, the Chinese Navy was huge, right? They had, they had ships that dwarfed the English ships by comparison, yet they never had any desire to go. And that's the thing, mm. is that, exp- that sense of adventure, the maverick spirit, the buccaneer type spirit that propelled the West and the West was at its height and greater strength when it had self-confidence mm. and had that spirit. And it's been the erosion of that, which accounts in large part for the decline. But this is actually more about an attack on the West than anything else. And what you've seen from the National Trust and the Wildlife Country Link and other heritage societies is this attempt to demonize the countryside in particular uh, about as a, as a white colonialist racist space. That's what it was called actually a couple of months ago. And why are they doing that? It's because, you know, the English, Scottish, Welsh and Northern Ireland landscapes are intrinsic to those nations' identities, right? There's something deeply spiritual, almost emotional about our connection to the land. If you know, if you ask an Englishman to think up, conjure up an image of England, it will always be a, the hill, the rolling hills, the patchwork quilts of, you know, England's green and pleasant land, you know, Elgar's Nimrod composed mm. at Malvern. That's what they're attacking because that's the essence of Englishness and of British identity. You know, absolutely, because anything, everything's on the table from Doctor Who to Only Fools and Horses to the very memory of Winston Churchill to the countryside itself. It's all on the table to be taken away, denigrated. Uh, it's, it's a sickening crime. Well, the attempt... A sickening crime, like almost unparalleled in history. I, th- I think the attempt is, as, as Camus pointed out in his essays, which we cannot cite or we'll get in trouble with YouTube again, but it's to gaslight a particular people out of the story they tell themselves that keeps them a cohesive people. Because you propagate yourself as a civilization, as a nation, as a community, a congregation, family over time by telling yourself a story about who you are, where you came from, how you survive, what you believe. And to root that in a time, a place, a context, a long tapestry of events prevents you from thinking that you are as interchangeable, fungible, and manipulable as this giant fleshy mass of the global majority. So at the same time, it's saying, well, we're all the same. We can. It doesn't matter whether you take one person from here and drop them here. They're just as British as you and me. But also, what is British anyway? And the only way we can define British is as uniquely evil, slaver, settler, colonialist, even though the countryside itself was never colonized and actually importing people from other places would amount to colonization head scratch, I suppose, but it's to it's to gaslight you out of a particular identity so that you can't put up any defense against the erasure of your culture and history via mass immigration. And that's how you demoralize a society, right? This is back to Besmanov, you know, the KGB defector, exactly, who said just this, you know, it takes, it takes a generation, it takes 25 years to demoralize a society, but that's by targeting their youth. And how do you do that? You, you, you denigrate or you eradicate their history. You tell them that they, they have no reason to be, have pride in nation. And once you sever that link between a people's and their culture and their history, they're ripe for ideological takeover. And what was the first thing that happened in, in the communist world after the collapse of communism? They restored their old flag, they restored their coats of arms, their national honors system, and their history and their, their history curriculum with great pride because they understood that's what they had been denied. And that was the one thing that actually kept the, the resistance going during all those years, along with the church, obviously. I should say orthodoxy as well. Yeah. Um, I, it's, it's, it's so cynical, isn't it? Um, it's, so, it's sort of unbelievably cynical. That's why, I, I, again, Lord Clark talks about the art, art historian, not the politician in their life today talks about confidence that a lot of it boils down to confidence all sorts of cultures and civilizations empires throughout the world um it it's all built on confidence and it's only once you lose that confidence that you can be quite easily defeated or subverted or something and yet it's very very cynically deliberately done um to the point where the countryside itself i, I don't know why i find it particularly disgusting and cynical, the push to say there's something wrong with white people in their own countryside, or let's flood the countryside with non-white, specifically non-white people for the sake of it, to demoralize. I don't know why that, of all things. Because you're defiling something beautiful. It's, it's, it's you're making, you're making it instrumental and co-opting it to a current ideological aim rather than letting it exist as a beautiful thing in and of itself. Something that's been cultivated as well across generations of people that, that valued it and put the hard work in, and now you feel entitled to inherit it and despoil it just for your own virtue signaling and for your own contempt of white people as an abstract category. No, thank you. But the important point you raised there is empire. And this is something I also wanted to get onto. It's that, okay, we are a global minority. 
our culture is paling in comparison to the big homogenous blob of the global majority. And actually, what is Britishness anyway? Because we're all a nation of immigrants, except <laughs> when we can be uniquely, uniquely beaten over the head by something that we have a great moral record on compared to all other civilizations, but yet it's contorted and reflected back on us to think that we don't have anything to be proud of. If you don't know what I'm talking about, there's another call for reparations. Oh, fun, 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 fun. This time dressed up in the pseudo-legitimacy of the words of an Anglican theologian, because as if the um, Church of England hasn't been defiled enough these days. Now, this is a Cambridge academic who's come out with a book, and his name is Dr. Michael Banner, and he's demanding that Britain pay Caribbean nations more than 200 billion in slavery reparations. So he's, he's come to this number based on the compensation claims made by slave owners when the trade was first abolished in 1833 and adding compound interest, and he said the total owed should be 205 billion. He said despite the UK government rejecting clay, the case for reparations, he's urging the Scottish government particularly to, quote, show leadership on the issue and pay back its share of 20 Point five billion. Now, I think this person is probably um, a white bloke who has been guilt-tripped by liberal priors into flagellating at the cause of anti-racism to prove his woke credentials. But there is a particularly insidious bent to this where foreign nations or racial grievance activists will set up a grifting industrial complex just to weaponize our own liberal sensibilities against us to cede to themselves resources they did not earn because they were not slaves. We did not enslave them, and so why should we pay any of this? Precisely. Well, the first thing to say is that this chap, Dr. Banner, is a C of V e clergyman and a Cambridge academic. In terms of woke intersectionality, I think he's at the core of all this. This is the same chap who defended one of his colleagues who said that Jesus had a trans body and that the wound in his side was actually symbolic of a vagina. That bloke, yeah. So, I, have um... people, I have people that went to that, um, that particular... Uh, act of blasphemy and walked out midway through. So, yeah, I didn't realise he was the same fella. That but, makes sense. But you're quite correct. This is purely a race grift, a race grift going on here. And, you know, I, I'm, and I try these days not to start out by saying, well, we ended the slave trade and da, 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 da. You know, the point I want to make to people is in what way has slavery actually denigrated your life? And how have you not basically benefited from living in the Caribbean? Because as horrendous as slavery was for your great, 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 great grandfathers, eight generations back we're talking about, had they stayed in Africa, your life would be undeniably worse than if you were living in the Caribbean. You know, most people who came in, in the, over on the Atlantic slave trade came from places like Benin and Nigeria, right? So the life expectancy in Benin is 60. In the Caribbean, it's about 10 to 15 years higher. In Trinidad, it's 74 years rather than 60. You know, the GDP annually in Benin is $1,300 a year. It's $16,000 in Trinidad, right? And more than 10 times higher. So by any measure, the lives of people in the Caribbean is far better than those living in, in West Africa. And you see that because obviously there's not a great migration track going mm -hmm. from the Caribbean to West Africa. Mm -hmm. Never mind the never mind the, the, the black people living in, in Britain or America, for example. Also, why should the British taxpayer be paying reparations? Out of a population of millions, there were only a few thousand slave owners, perhaps 3,000 sl slave owners, right? The majority of people in this country descend from people who lived lives of abject poverty and hardship akin to serfdom. Why should they pay? Then again, what about black people living here whose ancestors also come from Jamaica? Why should they be paying reparations to people in, in Trinidad and Tobago for this? The entire thing is, is a nonsense and it's a race grift and it's not about slavery. None of these cultural war things are about slavery. This is all about undermining Britain and the West. If this was about slavery, these race grifters would be equally vocal about surely the far more serious issue of modern day slavery, mm -hmm. where seven in every 1,000 Africans today is a slave. There's 10 million people. Pakistan is the global center of, of slavery. You know, you've got Sadiq Khan telling everybody he's always the son of a Pakistani bus driver, and he wants to have a slavery museum in this country. But when he went on an official visit to Pakistan, not once did he mention the issue of slavery when he was there. That's what's telling about all of this. These people should be protesting outside the high commissions of Nigeria, outside Cameroon and Sudan's embassy. We don't see any of that, which speaks volumes about the true agenda here. Very, very good point. I've never heard the thing about the wound in Christ's side being, being <laughs> vagina-like. Is it, is it Longinus who did that? Was that the Roman centurion who did that? I never, didn't know that was... I'd never heard of that. That's, that's Hopefully you'll never hear again about one it. One of the <laughs> most perverse things I've ever heard. But yeah, you make a great point that it's not about slavery, the, like the moral aspect of slavery. It's about money. It's about trying to um, destroy our, the fabric of our society and about guilt. Um, and yeah, and also the thing that I find odd 
is that we're told on one level that there's uh, everything about our history is is evil and wrong and morally bankrupt, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But that also at the same time, diversity built Britain. That there were I see somebody say there were millions of black people in Britain in the Roman era. Yeah, yeah, obviously absurd. Absolutely, completely, completely. Well, and they built charts, they built man. Stonehenge. If you look at BBC oh, yeah. horrible histories. <laughs> yeah, ever since Cheddar Man, we've been we've, we've been black. Well, did you not know um, that the one trumpeter actually ran the entire Tudor court? <laughs> right. Yeah, he was Henry VIII. <laughs> yeah. Um, no. Um, so yeah, it, it, they don't even try to make it make sense. Right. It, it's just being attacked from every angle, and it doesn't have to add up, but be logical or anything. But this is all about creating new myths, right? All cultures, all civilizations are founded on myths, right? London was supposed to be founded by Brutus of Troy, having defeated Gog and Magog, the giants, and all of that. The new myths being established by Sadiq Khan, London was built by immigrants. Rishi Sunak putting out a 50p coin, saying diversity is our greatest strength. These are the new myths that are being fo fo you know, foisted upon our children to try to pretend and create this new, this new dynamic and this new myth. And it's obviously an insult to the millennia of people who came before, who built St. Paul's Cathedral, who built our great cathedrals around the country and our castles and so forth. But you have to recognize what the true motivation and agenda is. Yeah, and the true motivation is clearly contemptuous anti-white gaslighting. And, and as you said, you don't necessarily want to start off with the fact of, but what about other slave trades? <clears throat> I think it's very telling as you said, we exported civilization essentially to other countries, that prior to the establishment of the British Empire and the moral crusade between 1807 and 1867 that was the single most expensive um, foreign aid venture in all of human history to abolish the slave trade, these civilizations were crucifying mothers and children on the roads to their kingdoms. They were turning around and King Geyser was saying, we sing our children to sleep at night with the song of an enemy vanquished to slavery. They were they were loving it and bathing in it. And all of these riches, like everything from the, the Benin bronzes to all these precious metals, were still in the dirt and they didn't have a functioning country. So there should be some gratitude here. It's very telling they're not going to them. Catman, yeah. saying, well, you sold millions of our African brothers and sisters into bondage. Um, the Barbary pirates took 1.25 million Brits off the coast of Cornwall and the like and sold them into slavery. We're not seeking reparations from them. Instead, they're going to cap in hand to the British and saying, well, we know that we can exploit your liberal priors and your waning Christian principles, so um, pay up whitey. Basically, that's precisely it. There were more Africans held in bondage in Africa than were ever transported across the Atlantic. And all those who were transported were enslaved by other Africans. Europeans never went inland. They just moored off the coast and went to the slave markets on, on the beachfronts and, and in these places. Uh, yet there are no calls at all for this. You know, and we've had the statue of Edward Coulston being toppled. Meanwhile, museums are returning these beloved Benin bronzes. The Benin bronzes literally depict royal slave owners. <laughs> And they've been re returned to the descendants of these slave owners who's now put them on private display so the public can't even see them any longer. And yet no one seems to think there's any problem at all with that. The Arab slave trade, of course, existed for hundreds of years before the British or the French or Europeans arrived in Africa. And when the British were, and the French were trying to abolish the slave trade, the amount of resistance they had from Africans who wanted it to carry on because mm. it was such a lucrative industry for them. You know, the reason we don't have a huge number of black people in the Middle East is because the, the, the Arabs were so brutal, they would castrate all the slaves going, going over there. But it's clearly here a, 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 a desire to portray the West uniquely as evil, even though never in history had a nation actually worked against its own economic self-interest for the moral good. You know, the evangelical zeal that went through Victorian Britain, the second half of the British Empire was atoning for the, the sins of the first half of that. 2% of GDP was spent on the West Africa squadron. That's equivalent to our entire uh, defense budget today. And yet we don't get any credit for that. So rather than, you know, as I say, self-flagellating, we should be celebrating this fact. The Church of England should be at the forefront of saying we were the ones who started all of this, along with the Quakers. Instead of that, they're talking about 40 billion or something of reparations that they have to pay. I mean, it's a complete nonsense. Yeah, we, we hear endlessly about people like Coulson or just the, the, just the evils of the transatlantic slave trade. But we very rarely get told about the abolitionist movement. There's not sort of a, 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 a Channel 4 do a week on the, the abolitionist history. You don't really hear it, do you? Or uh, you mentioned the Barbary slave trade, the North, North African coast there, and well over a million people. And uh, um, Jefferson went to war over that. Don't hear about that, but you do hear about the handful of slaves he had at Monticello. Uh, yeah, the Arabs, the, I mean, F King Faisal still had slaves, black slaves 
in the early 20th century. He used pictures of him, I'm sure you've seen them, at Versailles with a giant Sudanese slave with him. A slave. There's open air markets still uh, in Libya to this day. Right, Thank yeah. you, Hillary Clinton. You mentioned yeah. Pakistan, India, China, in Central Africa itself to this day. Giant slave markets. Hundreds of slaves sold every every week in, in uh, Libya. But then they just had that film out recently. What was it called? Warrior, Warrior Women or uh, something? Uh, well, the Woman King. The Woman King, right? This is celebrating the, the warriors of the kingdom of Dahomey and, and Benin. They would sacrifice thousands of slaves. They had ritual annual sacrifices. Hundreds of thousands of slaves eventually were, were murdered there in the most brutal treatment possible. And yet this w- it was fine to make, make this film with no mention of that at all. But could you imagine a film being made about, the, you know, in a po- positive light about George Washington or Jefferson today? That wouldn't happen. And yet here you have clear evidence of a brutal, murderous, slave-owning regime, and that becomes a blockbuster. The great irony of the... Well, it lost a lot of money, but oh, there you go. Know, right, Fortunately, so, the great irony of that is as well is that the homie Amazons, these supposed warrior queens engaged in a firefight with French soldiers and the French for once didn't surrender. They suffered no casualties and killed the entire Amazons and the rest of them surrendered. The only ones that actually they did kill of the French and Inja were because the Dahomey's masqueraded as prostitutes got into the tents and then attacked them in the dead of night. So not quite the fighting force and black cat power we were expecting. So I suppose we can uh, we can wrap up that segment with um, any time you hear the phrases diversity or global majority, just read it as a dog whistle for anti-white racism and move swiftly on. I hope you appreciated that segment from the podcast to the Lotus Eaters. And if you want to see more of the work we're doing, you can go on down to lotuseaters.com where you can check out series like Lads Hour, as well as you can follow us on Twitter to see the rest of what we're doing on the website.